Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and this is another in a series of programs that relate to our quickly and dramatically aging society. Key to our conversation, once again, is the MacArthur Foundation's research network on an aging society, which asks us to imagine a society with many more seniors with walkers than youngsters in strollers when those over age 60 will clearly outnumber those under 15, and which asks us to consider realistically what Americans will have to do to accommodate these new demographic facts of life. Here again today is the chair of MacArthur's Aging Society Network, Dr. John Rowe of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Earlier, Dr. Rowe led Harvard's program in academic geriatrics, was president and CEO of Mount Sinai Hospital and Medical School in New York, then served as president and CEO of Aetna, the healthcare organization. With him is another member of MacArthur's Aging Society Network, Dr. Linda P. Freed, Dean of the Mailman School of Public Health and Professor of Epidemiology. Dr. Fried is the co-founder of Experience Corps, which helps improve academic outcomes for elementary school children while simultaneously promoting the health of older adults. And Dr. Fried, I would begin today by asking whether you think one of the ways of approaching this question of what are we going to do about us old people, and I'm referring to myself, mm -hmm is finding more and more ways of making the older people, the elders, I should say, and the younger people in our society benefit from each other's presence? You know, I think that's the right question. I think it's the question that we have to figure out together. But we already have a huge number of models of that. We benefit tremendously from each other's presence uh, in terms of obvious things like grandparenting. Um, children with grandparents to invest in them uh, have a layer of um, psychological benefit that, th that really helps with their growth and development, and we all recognize that on a daily basis. We also do better together um, by having multi-generations outside of the home, too. Uh, one, one example of that which you already alluded to is the Experience Corps program, which we designed as a way to see those benefits very visibly for who we are as a society. Uh, and the reason for the benefits are, are uh, that older adults volunteer tremendously. There's a great desire to give back as people get older and to make sure that future generations do well. And a program like Experience Corps, which is designed to really harness that great desire to make a difference, the time that people have, their life experience and smarts, into a way to really help all of our children is one clear demonstration of mutual benefit investing in one generation to ensure the success of another. Well, Dr. Rowe and I spoke earlier at another program about the, the myths mm -hmm. that characterize the problems of old and young. 
and one of them, of course, had to do with this myth number five, policymakers must choose between investments in youth or the elderly. Does this program um, fit into your undermining that myth? Very much so. Uh, it's very interesting that advocates for one group uh, often attempt to get more resources for their chosen group by uh, trying to degrade the value of other groups. It's a little bit like negative advertising in a political campaign. Rather than just saying the good things about your candidate, you say bad things about other candidates. And uh, some advocates for youth programs, and we're all for youth programs, obviously, uh, have taken a position that, um, that children are the only age group that's worth, quote, investing in and uh, that policymakers must choose between the young and the elderly. And we see it very differently. Uh, we see uh, the solution to be uh, intergenerational programs, uh, activities uh, that benefit uh, individuals who are young as well as elderly in the same kind of program Linda's Experience Corps, in which older uh, individuals volunteered 15 hours a week uh, for young children in inner city schools, uh, found benefits for the children and also benefits for the elders. Another prime example we touched on was in South Africa, my favorite example in the world, where when pensions were given to grandmothers, the granddaughters in those households were taller and heavier <laughs> and I think did better in school. But how do you, how do you institutionalize this insight? I, I'm fascinated by what you say, Dr. Rowe, and I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to you and the uh, core mm -hmm. uh, that you described in which everyone benefits, but how widespread is this how widespread can it be? Do you think we're likely as a people to institutionalize this level of cooperation, not picking the young or picking the mm -hmm. elderly, mm -hmm. but making them work together? So there are several different answers to that. One is we have to see the possibilities and not make the assumptions that we have to select one group compared to another, or that we have to pit groups against each other. I started thinking about this many years ago, actually asking myself the same question you just asked me, if there was a way to bring out the potential here, because it's not good for a society in, in the long run to have to choose between its people. And if you can bring out the mutual benefits that are already there and make them even stronger, then we become stronger as a society. And so I asked myself that question uh, a long time ago, and experience, I designed Experience Corps with Mark Friedman to really try and provide one model. Since that time, um, Experience Corps is now in 22 cities in the United States, providing an example of at least a starting point for a, a frame change. But I think we have to, as a, as a country, really, recognize that this is not all a deficit equation. There are tremendous benefits of having more older adults around for everybody. Well, what does the Experience Corps do? How does it work mm -hmm. that enables you now, I gather, to give a much more optimistic answer to the question that I right. ask you and that you ask yourself? Right. So experience, we designed Experience Corps on several key principles. One was using evidence as to uh, what children needed to support their success. Young children in, in public elementary schools. Uh, public elementary schools in this country are uh, really inadequately supported in terms of human capital. Children are uh, particularly at risk children, but most children need more adults in their lives supporting their success and and there is a lot of evidence that children act out in school in negative ways if they are frustrated or not able to keep up and so 
if you could design a program that would give children the people around them, the support of adults, and in this case, older adults, to ensure that they don't fall behind, that they're in there succeeding, that they're getting the skills that they need, that, and teachers need lots of help in that. That's one approach, and we very carefully, working with early childhood educators, uh, designed roles appropriate to older adults who have not historically been educators so that they could bring value added to the children's success and support the success of the teachers. And at the same time, we very intentionally, I very intentionally built on public health evidence as to what helps people stay healthy, active, engaged, independent as they get older. Thinking now about the other end of right. the population right. scale. And what would be meaningful to people? What, where, how do you construct something and let them know that they're making a huge difference? Because people, older people like most people, come if, if they can contribute significantly, and they stay if they are. And if you can hide inside that ways to help them be healthier, um, then perhaps they'll stay for one thing and benefit for another reason. Yeah, I think it's worth uh, stepping back and thinking about what the problem is we're trying to solve here. And uh, we live in an age-segregated society. Many of your friends are your age, my friends are my age, you know, 30-year-olds hang out with 30-year-olds, they live with 30-year-olds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we build housing that is designed for people of certain ages. Um, and many people feel that as the cost of old age entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, and the like continue to uh, escalate, that it will pit one generation against another. We haven't seen that yet, uh, but it may happen. The likelihood uh, that it will happen is, in my mind, related to whether or not we continue with this age-segregated society. The second point is that when we look at an aging society, most people think that this is all doom and gloom. It's the demographic time bomb. What we're trying to say, and as Linda is very articulate in saying in, with her program, is that there's also a positive side. There's an upside. There are opportunities as well as challenges. How The question you're asking is how do we unlock those opportunities in an age-integrated society? And, and I think we have to keep that goal in mind every time we design a city or a transportation system or an educational system or the workplace or the work site or retirement rules, et cetera. We need to think about the goal of an age-integrated society that will unlock the advantages. Well, in thinking this way, and I wondered, as Linda Freed discussed this, uh, you know, I'm the practical one, and the, not the naysayer. And we're the, we're the academics. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, I didn't quite mean it that way. And, I interrupted you. And, and I, was, I was changing it from uh, the practical one to, uh, you just took a drink from that cup. I know from our first encounter that you generally think in terms of the cup being half full. And I generally think in terms of it being half empty. And I look at this and ask whether, in reality, does the school system, in general, accept and make room for the elderly in this way? What so have you found? I would say that we are not proposed, uh, excuse me, we are not prepared mentally to see older adults in the schools as a net plus. Our, frame of mind is to think about aging in a very negative and deficit focused way. And so just as we intentionally have to decide who we want to be as a society in an aging society, we have to look at the evidence as to whether those presumptions are true. And they're not true. But I can tell you uh, from the moment that I designed Experience Corps that the upfront process of working with schools initially and principals to see if they would accept a cadre of older adults as trained volunteers um, suggests it's not easy. But, and, and I'll tell you one story. So um, in Baltimore, 
uh, where I first fielded Experience Corps, one of the principals, who I subsequently became great friends with, uh, agreed that we could try out the program with her and bring in 10 older adults. And we trained them, we recruited them, we trained them. They were actually members of her community. Uh, they were there because they profoundly wanted to make a difference for the success of the kids. But when I brought them in and she saw that one of them was in a wheelchair, um, she looked at me and she said, I'm questioning my sanity. Fast forward three months, I, s I talked to her and she said, you know, this morning I saw four little children carefully pushing this gentleman's wheelchair down the hallway and um, asking who could push him on the elevator, who could stand next to him, whether any of them could sit on his lap. Uh, she said, this has been fabulous. And after that, she said, can I have 60 more volunteers? So our presupposition that having older adults in the school is going to be essentially a babysitting service by the schools, uh, once people experience what older adults in their school can do, it's transformational and their attitudes change. But if they, if they were asked up front to make a decision based on their image right. of what an older person is, they wouldn't say yes. And while that man couldn't walk, he obviously could interact with the kids it, very it effectively. Fabulous. And we have to understand that, that aging is changing. Old people are different than they used to be. Much of what we have to say about the potential opportunities of an age-integrated society is based on the supposition that old people will live longer and healthier and continue to be functional later in life. And all the trends we see, all the surveys we see, are going in that direction. Also, in terms of our own educational experience over the past decades, we're obviously talking about a more mature, more mature group, we're talking about a better educated uh, group. Much, much any, so. of, any of the big cities uh, that you have aimed at going along with you? Um, 22 out of 22 are. In Baltimore City, Experience Corps it has been adopted by the Baltimore City school system, also true in Philadelphia, as a key component of, of how to educate their students. And they, both cities are rolling the program out across the whole city in their elementary schools. And, a, know, and a county, our group, our MacArthur-funded group, has been approached by a county in California uh, where the uh, government of the county has said, you know, the California state budget is mm -hmm. in trouble. Many of the aides that used to work in the schools are gone. The jobs have been eliminated. Uh, can you help us design uh, strategies that will enhance uh, volunteering in the school system in our county? And, and what Jack is, is suggesting, which I think is very important, is that for us to be intentional about how to really experience more fully the benefits of being an aging society, we have to think beyond any one model in terms of the needs and implications. So um, how do we keep people healthy as they live longer lives? That's a key issue both in terms of their ability to contribute, but it's a key issue in terms of our experience of what aging means as a society if people are healthy and contributing and participating. Programs like this could be very intentionally designed, as Experience Corps is, to again, help people stay healthy. And again, your experience is with the Experience Corps that so, your participants, the elderly, have shown. So uh, people who participate in Experience Corps feel better, but they also are stronger. They are much more physically active. We designed the roles to exercise their minds as well, and we're seeing very exciting data, um, which we're not totally surprised about, that their brains are actually functioning better, their memories better, particularly if they started out a little bit at risk of, of memory impairment. Their memory's better, and their what's called executive function, their problem-solving abilities, are much improved. And 
we just completed a study led by Michelle Carlson uh, looking at functional MRIs of the brain, which shows brain activity and shows that experienced core volunteers with about a high school education over just one year of participation actually have much more active brains in the very key problem-solving areas of the brains than they did before. And the people who didn't participate um, show no change. So there is, if we're intentional about how we design roles, we can also bring tremendous benefit to the older participants as yeah, well. Th there's a value added that goes beyond the assumption, well, they've got to do something, keep themselves busy, isn't it nice that they're going and volunteering in the church or the school or whatever. And, and one of the central points of resistance that we found is that in our society, unless something is monetized, unless it has a financial value, it doesn't count. So people assume that these kinds of volunteering activities are just sort of ways to keep busy, get off the couch. And it, one example, one way to look at it, if there are two women uh, in apartments next to each other here in New York taking care of their frail uh, older husbands, um, that's not in the economy. That's, nobody sees that. Nobody sees the value of that, the financial impact of that. If they switch jobs and took care of each other's husband, now they're in the economy. They pay each other the same amount. They're in the GDP. And if one of them quits, she's probably eligible for unemployment insurance. Uh, now we're counting it. Okay, let me ask you, have you counted, have you monetarized the experience core experience? So we are starting to. We're actually, uh, with support from the MacArthur Foundation, conducting a study to do that. But the very initial analyses are very positive, that the improvements in health of the older adults combined with the, if we project out, the likelihood that children who are succeeding through third grade are going to stay in school, graduate from high school, continue into uh, higher education, um, that is a net plus financially, economically, in terms of societal investment. Uh, it has an ROI. ROI. Return on investment. Yeah. The American uh, theme. The American theme. Okay, but let's, let's move away slightly from the American thing. Tell me again about the children themselves, mm -hmm. their academic, um, what's been added, what's the value that's been added to them in the schools? So I can tell you the early data. In uh, a year or two, we'll have a lot more, but there's very clear benefit in terms of their reading success, performance, and their love of reading. There's very clear benefit in terms of behaviors, behaviors that are key to long-term success in school. So uh, readiness to learn, uh, which seems to be greatly improved by um, the kind of relationship building with, with the older adults in the school, with training the older adults to help children enjoy things like reading. But in addition, um, a study that we did in the Baltimore City Schools where we put a critical mass of older adults in every school from kindergarten through third grade, enough to ensure that every child is touched by support from an older adult, we see dramatic improvements in behavior, dramatic improvements by, their ch by these children. So that they seem, according to the principals and teachers, they stop acting out for uh, attention in a negative way because they're getting so much positive support and attention in a positive way. And because of that, um, children in kindergarten through third grade who get referred to the principal's office at high rates, the rates drop by 30 to 50 percent in an experience course school. I was going to ask you about the matter of behavior because you had said something before we began the program <coughs> about older societies. Mm -hmm. Behav violence is down, behavior is better generally. Mm -hmm. So there is something that we old, mm -hmm. older people mm -hmm. uh, accomplish. Yeah. So there, I think you're setting me up very nicely, but there are many things that older people accomplish. We, when we have the image of a population with strollers, 
compared to a population with walkers. And we focus on the walkers. It causes us, I think, to forget all the benefits. Certainly, communities with a higher proportion of older people in them actually seem to have lower violence rates. They have more stability because older people are more likely to be homeowners. Um, uh, older adults in communities are um, the volunteer core of communities in general, uh, bringing food to neighbors and looking in on whether people are doing okay and watching that the community is okay. So there's this silent fabric, um, which is layered upon what Jack was saying about the net benefit financially of just the caregiving and volunteering roles. So U.S. data would say, says that older adults just in caregiving for family members and neighbors and in volunteering contribute $162 billion a year in this country in net worth of, uh, of roles. Uh, which I might add is um, much higher than the cost of long-term care itself. So these benefits, of course, uh, are dependent upon getting older people to interact with younger people, and that would be greatly facilitated by having age-integrated communities. So people say, well, what do you mean by that? How would you do that? How is that different than what we do now? I'm no architect or urban designer, but I, I think I put the retirement communities near the schools. <laughs> you know, I, I would put them off in some gated community somewhere. Uh, I think I designed the transportation systems and uh, the city centers in such a way that they're accessible for older people as well as younger people. Well, that's the problem you're going to have to solve, that the network is going to have to uh, present to the powers that be That's right. to resolve. And uh, I'm afraid I have to say that our time is up yeah. now. But I want to thank you, Dr. Freed and Dr. Dr. Rowe, for joining me again in this discussion that needs to go on and on and on. Thanks. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit our Open Mind website at theopenmind.tv or 13.org slash openmind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.